Spy agencies are the stuff of fantasy and fiction, so it is fitting that one of our best journalists on the spooky world of foreign affairs has used his vast travels and knowledge to write a novel. Washington Post columnist David Ignatius has followed up his book, Body of Lies, which was turned into a Hollywood blockbuster, with a new offering. This one is called Blood Money. It spans the CIA's operations here and the murky world of Pakistan's powerful inter-services intelligence. The key really is figuring out where the facts end and where the fiction begins. David, David Ignatius joins me now. So I, mean, I love this book, as I did, by the way, the, the other book, which was The Increment, which was about Iran's nuclear program. You really choose these, these topics that jump off the front pages. And you, when one's reading it, because I know how much you know about the CIA and how much time you spend talking to people, I have to believe lots of it is true. Well, I, I don't want to play games with you, my friend or, or the reader. Uh, I, I am uh, painting on a canvas of fiction with, with the colors of life. I, I have spent lots of time with the ISI. I've traveled with them to South Waziristan. I've met with their director general, uh, General Pasha. Uh, as I said in Time Magazine the other week, I even have an email correspondence with ISI officers. So I do know the real life subject. Um, and I've tried in Blood Money to tell a story that gets at the crazy relationship between the ISI and the CIA. This, this absolutely fascinating, often mutually destructive, uh, two scorpions in a bottle kind of relationship that they have. That said, I do have to say, this, this is a novel. It wouldn't be fun to read if it wasn't reinvented, if it wasn't real life reinvented in the mind of the author. So, but let's start with the CIA. Okay, so you've got a CIA uh, operation, and you have these guys often um, on their own, often in businesses uh, as fronts. You know, I always thought that CIA officers were at the U.S. Embassy, and that uh, while you didn't know who they were, you could kind of make some guesses about them. Is it in fact true that there are lots of CIA officers around who have uh, covers in private business and trading companies and things like that all over it's, the world? It's increasingly true. Um, when you and I were getting started as journalists, uh, and for, for the, the past decades, it's been the case that most CIA officers sought what was called official coverers, embassy representatives, other official international organizations. That was acceptable when the target you were chasing was Soviet diplomats, you'd meet them at cocktail parties, spot them, try to develop them. But the targets are so different now. And so there's a feeling that you need genuinely clandestine platforms. So there's been a lot of experimentation in, in the areas that I'm imagining in my book. Uh, in, in the book, I, I invent this goofy entertainment company uh, based in Studio City, California, which is called the Hit Parade, which is a, a platform for CIA officers to do completely secret operations overseas. Are they doing that kind of thing? Uh, not to the extent that I write in my book, but, but I'm sure that they're exper experimenting with what they call non-official cover or knock operations. The problem is they're really hard to, to manage and they're really expensive. And so there's still a big cadre of naysayers at Langley who say, don't do this. All right, now Pakistan. So you paint a picture of the Inter-Services Intelligence Directorate uh, that from what I can tell is very true to life. In this particular sense, they have lots of connections with all these militant groups. They've always had them, and at some level, they don't even deny that they have them. They say these are elements of Pakistani society, um, and yet they are quite reluctant to do anything about them, to shut them off in any way. Do you think that that part of the book that you describe is true to life? Yes. I think the, the tragedy of the ISS, ISI, and arguably of Pakistan as a whole, is that it's caught in the, a web that it's spun with our help, it must be said, uh, that, that it, it now can't escape from. It's, it's a web, first of connections with jihadi organizations. The ISI is, above all, a, a paramilitary organization. It doesn't do all that much collection of intelligence. Right. It's not a very good spy agency, but it's good at running right. covert action. The general framework of the book is that the CIA and the ISI are cooperating, but the CIA, uh, the CIA is running effectively covert ops against the ISI, and the IS ISI is at least allowing these jihadi groups to attack and, and infiltrate the CIA. Uh, and that spider's web seems very real. That 
that is, that is that is drawn from life. I mean, the, the truth is that these intelligence services operate against each other. That happens more in real life, not just with Pakistan, but uh, we have a complicated intelligence relationship with France. We have a complicated intelligence relationship with with, uh, with other allies. But uh, th there's a way in which the CIA and ISI both absolutely need each other and absolutely don't trust each other. And it's, it's been a particularly volatile combination because they're always marching in tandem. But you, you can imagine a, a situation where one guy is you know, sort of trying to trip the other or nudging him or you know, up, up, to, up to some kind of horseplay. That, that's what it's like. And uh, I, I used to think you know, that these two should get a marriage counselor <laughs> and, 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 and figure it out. I've kind of given up on that. I mean, the reality is intelligence services lie. That's what their job is. These guys are going to keep lying to each other. They just they need political control to get them going in the same direction for the for the national interests of both countries. And if they can do that, I'd, I'd have some hope this this story will turn out acceptably. I mean, somebody you know well, General Petraeus, is going to move over from the military to head the CIA. What will he bring to the agency? What is going on, particularly on the covert operation side? Because in a sense, that will be the most critical part of the of the mission running covert operations in Pakistan and Afghanistan to a lesser extent in Yemen. Well, interestingly, the, uh, the Pakistanis are afraid of Petraeus. They don't like him. They, they, they feel that he has a harsher edge than General McChrystal did. So his appointment was seen as bad news in Islamabad. Uh, General Petraeus um, has a, a stronger force of will than any military officer I think I've ever encountered. We saw that in Iraq where he really bent that story around around his determination and, and President Bush's. Um, he's had less success, frankly, in, in Afghanistan. Uh, one thing that Petraeus is very good at, I've seen this over many years of, of traveling with him, is using often unlikely back channels. Uh, he's, he's, he's good at finding people who can get him access to people and places that are important to him as a commander. It's a skill that's quite unusual. And in truth, it's a skill that, that is not found widely in, in this administration. So I think um, the, the ability to be operational, to, to head out on, on, on quiet missions, to meet with heads of state, heads of other intelligence services, to get business done on that level, I think, I think General Petraeus will be quite good at. David Ignatius, thank you so much. It's a great book. I thank, thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you for reading.